You're listening to the Mobcast Network. Welcome, my friends, to the catacombs, the deep underground layer where we keep the really weird stuff at that cult movie cantina. I'm your Native American pop culture spirit guide, Scotty, and I'm joined by my co-hoss, co-hoss, Drew. What's up, Drew? Uh, co-hoss. Co-hoss. Yeah. I'm Drew, the co-hoss. I think that's... My voice is a little bit deeper. I was going to see if you could do that all show. I might be able to do... <laughs> I might be able to, it's like a Sam Elliott meets the trailer guy. Haas was my favorite character on Bonanza, by the way. Of course, everyone's favorite character is Haas. I thought it was like Michael Landon, um, who I cannot remember his name. Yeah, I can't either. So I he, see his face. Right, but I can't well, remember. You remember Haas. I remember Haas. So Haas is the best. You just want to hug Haas and like. <laughs> yeah. He pretty, he, I, although sometimes I wonder if Haas is like of mice and men. Right. <laughs> He's like fuzzy and you know, then it's too late. <laughs> Your neck's broken. <laughs> That's an episode that didn't air. <laughs> <laughs> on this, <laughs> wait, it's one of those. Uh, Tell me on about this the... very special episode of Bonanza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I keep wanting to say John Boy, but it's not. What is? What is uh, I see it. Little Joe. Little Joe. So uh, tell me about the rabbits, Little Joe. <laughs> tell me about the rabbits. <laughs> it's, <definitely rabbit. laughs> it's terrible, but so, uh, we love it. Uh, Lynn Cart, uh, Ben Ben Cartwright was Lauren Green. Yeah, Battlestar Galactica. Yep. Or or the mutual Omaha nature videos. Remember yep. those when we were Absolutely. kids? Absolutely. In fact, I pulled those up. I referenced those in a movie one time, and I and trying to get the music licensed. Right. So I went after it, and they were like, "Yeah, you can license it. It's fifty thousand dollars." I was like, "It plays for four seconds." <laughs> they can no. give you. They can give you the four second credit. I was like, it's a kids movie, not really, but I mean, it's like a it's a PG family film. It was for Nigel and Oscar. Like, there's a random scene in the movie where right. I wanted the mutual of Omaha opening to occur. So that you, because that movie is all about paying it back. It's all like nostalgia, the entire damn thing. Am I a little, little key? A little, a little bit. We can fix it. Well, I'll just back off this microphone. No, 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 no. You were just when you were backing off, you were getting soft. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> you got to eat this thing. You got to eat it. Um. So, uh, they can't give you like a disc for four second cutting. Nope. I mean, they could. Uh, see, that's the thing. They can all do it, but it's it's not the publisher. I'm sure. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure the the Recording wouldn't care. It's the publisher. Whoever, 99% of the time in movies, the reason you get terrible songs is because some a-hole is holding the publishing rights. Right. And that's usually what messes it up. Or vice versa, they're holding the recording rights, and the artist is like, yeah, you can use it. Like, uh, Delinquent Habits. Do you remember them? No. All right, so they're like a Spanish-influenced hip-hop group. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember. Trace Hombres. I can't remember the name of the song that was really popular. I ended up talking to- I'll find it, put in the show notes. How about that? Yeah, please do it. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. I found the guy who wrote the song, who was the head of that band, and he was like, yeah, you can absolutely use it. So then I have to go to Universal. Yeah, Universal or DGC. Who had DGC? Whoever had that record label. And I had to go out to them, and they were like, oh, yeah, sure, you can get it. It's uh, Favorite Nations, $20,000 per side, which means you're $20,000 for publishing, $20,000 for the recording. (sighs) So that guy, I told him, he's like, well, you can't afford that. I was like, you're right, I can't afford it. I was like, I'll write you a brand new song. I was like, yeah, that doesn't really work for what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but, no offense. But, no, but it's a nice gesture. It you're is just, a great gesture. Thought. But I needed like a 90s song that people had heard before. Right. So, see, my thought in it, that maybe it's just the business sense in me. To me, it's like, all right, so I'm I, if I can't get $50,000, let's get some money. Because some money's better than no money. No, no, I agreed. And so it was like, if it's going to be four seconds... How much is a second worth to us? So, you know, how long is a song? Divide it by 50,000. That's how much, you know? It might have been five, but whatever it was, it was just past the sampling. Right. So we tried to do the sampling gimmick. Right. But the problem was this we're literally paying homage directly to. Right. So the sampling was on par. I got you. I got you. Shattered my dreams. I'm. S- <laughs> we're being thematic early, aren't we? I'm drinking tangerine dream right now. <sighs> it's tangerine and vodka. Yeah, got you. Tangerine dream also did the uh, soundtrack to Firestarter. Oh, then that's good. That's I, Paul Hasselger. Have you ever heard his music? Yeah, he's one of my favorite composers. I didn't realize he did the tangerine dream to the music. Yeah, so when, when I watch Firestarter, it sounds like a John Carpenter score because it's very low key synthy. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, John Carpenter did this, right? No, no, tangerine dream. I'm like, awesome. And that's killer. <clears throat> 
It's a it's a movie we'll probably do on this podcast. It's a good show. Yep. You can check us out on the we- on our website at scottywhite.com. You can join the discussion of the Cult Movie Cantina Facebook page, facebook.com slash cantina. Our movies are old, like your grandma, so why don't you talk to her on Facebook while you're visiting us on Facebook? The place your grandma goes and weird movies lurk. Facebook. It's <laughs> the first time I've ever heard that. But the first really, time I've read it. <laughs> I love it. Can we keep that as a theme? We can. Our movies are weird, like your grandma. Or your dad. I was more like dude. I was more like they're weird, like Facebook, because that's where your grandma goes. <laughs> I'm working with this artist. I, I'm working with this artist for this uh, Kickstarter I've got. I will not plug it on this show, but you should totally you go should to scottywhite.com. It's, it's com. actually a really good read. But um, you gave me a nice blurb for it. It's a good read. It's cinematic. But uh, so the artist I was working with, she she just on her Twitter, she was like, I I don't check my Facebook unless I want to talk to my grandma, and that's how I thought of. <laughs> oh, brilliant! <laughs> this is what I thought. Inspiration of. everywhere. So that's what I thought of, thought of. This week we take a look at the sci-fi horror classic, Dreamscape. Alex Gardner has a unique talent. And even he doesn't know what it can do. No one has ever done it before. No one has even conceived of doing it before. You're going into another person's dream. You might have to see that to believe it. He is about to enter a world that no one has ever seen before. The world of your dreams. I was under the impression we were conducting scientific research here. You sound as if you don't approve. I can see you're going to be a real challenge to work with. Oh, wait a minute, Doctor. I haven't agreed to anything yet. There's somebody in my dreams. Who? An awful, ugly monster. This kid is being eaten alive and nobody gives a damn. Whatever his demon is, you have to help him face it. There's nobody there. Are you sure, Alex? He's always there. But Alex will make a discovery more frightening than any dream. What's going on? I had to let you know you're in danger. You want my secrets? Just want some advice. I'm afraid he has to be killed. I'm a science mentor. But I think I should deal with this on my own. And now, his only way out is to go back in to the dreamscape. Kate Capshaw, Dreamscape. When you close your eyes, the adventure begins. <laughs> it's just that, so that my problem, my bit, my my favorite thing about this movie, including the trailer, is the graphic. Yeah, the graphic's cool. Because in a weird way, like I'm sure some people might see that graphic and be like, "Oh, that's super dated," and it is. But that was hand drawn. Oh like, yeah, it was. Back then, there were no, you know, 3D titling. There's no After Effects, which no. is open sitting right beside me, right? right. There's no After Effects for for titles to be made. That was a hand drawn title. Someone had to think that through and then animate it frame by frame, and like a freaking cartoon. And it's awesome. It's great. It's awesome. Um, the poster for this movie though is pretty awesome too. The original or the the because you know they changed the box art, right? But the 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 original poster, the original yeah. the original eighty four poster, um, is amazing, and. I am. I'm gonna be the old guy here. In my day, posters were better. Of course they were, because they're all rip rip offs of Drew Struzan. Right. I mean, every single one of them is a rip off of Struzan. Because when I looked at Drew did Drew Struzan do this? No, but it looked just like a Drew Struzan poster. <laughs> Some executive was like, "Hey, uh, give me that Drew Struzan guy." And they're like, "We can't afford him." And then they're like, "Uh, get his cousin Ted." <laughs> Ted Struzan. Ted Struzan's really good. I like him. It's really good work. Uh, uh, it's got. Like the the poster's got Dennis Quaid with a torch and Cape Cashall's never. Where's the torch come from? Uh, the end of the movie when he's picking up the torch to fight the snake monster. Oh dear God! So one frame. Right, right, right. So, but, but, so you watch, the, you look at that poster, and you go, I want to see this movie. Oh, 100 percent. You don't get that movie. No. <laughs> this podcast, actually, that's a theme on this podcast. I have a feeling is that 99 percent of the time, the posters are for movies that were pre-sold, and they're going to look way better. Better, they're going to look way yeah, better. Yeah, that movie looks like an adventure. It, in fact, it almost reminds me. I haven't looked at it. 
I have to do some cross research. Do you remember the old Alan Quartermain movies? Oh yeah, I love them. Oh yeah, I do. I, I I used to. I went back and watched. Oh, they're terrible. I went back and watched uh, the first one, uh, Lost City of Gold. Oh, no, that's no, the second one. That's the uh, second one. Uh, uh, King, uh, King, Solomon's King Solomon's Mine Vines. was the yep. first one because they're both Canon films. Yep. And with Richard Chamberlain. Yep. And uh, who was the her? She's. It's not Daryl Hannah. It's um. It's somebody. Uh, so, um. Uh, Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone, yeah. Yeah, that's it's one it. her for that's canon film. It's like it's up there with Firewalker. <laughs> but she's good in it. Oh, she's good. I mean, Richard Chamberlain's good. fine. Richard Chamberlain's great. But I mean, it's <laughs> the worst poor man's rip off of Indiana oh, yeah. Jones. The poster for one of those looks exactly like the Dreamscape poster. All right. I I and I love those. I mean, we'll have to do one at least one. We may do them both on the show. I mean, if, if, I mean King Solomon's is great because <clears throat> it has the weird worm creatures, but but Elvira's in the second one that she's in the Lost City of Gold. Yep. Uh, and then what about uh, the dude? Cassandra Peterson. And then he hits it and the gold melts and covers him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. That's a perfect. As a kid, movie. I thought that was R- Ricardo Montalvan and it was not. <laughs> That's the same guy. Yeah, right. I thought forever. I was like, I, I am to be in. I was not. like, oh, it's the guy from uh, Star Trek, Wrath of God. Right. He's here. And um, James Earl Jones is in it. And it's. It's, it's weird when you start digging in. Like, this movie. Actually has a really good cast, minus Kate Capshaw. Huh? I-, I couldn't get into her again. <laughs> well, it's Kate Capshaw. Yeah, I just she's uh, not. It's not. This isn't a, a attractive, non attractive thing. No, 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 no. She's she's, she's very, beautiful. She's beautiful. It, it, yeah. So it has nothing to do. With it. I just I don't believe her because she's forever stuck in my brain, in my adolescent brain as Indiana Jones's <laughs> side hustle. <laughs> right? Because like he didn't care Indy! about it. Yeah, I just so it just didn't work, and then. When she married to Spielberg, still is. Well, good for her. Still is. I have five kids. Good for her. I looked it up while I was doing my research. Yeah, my that's thought good. was, are they still married now? Because I know he's been married before, but he married earlier and then married her. Oh, gotcha. So, Dreamscape came out as I mentioned in 1984. It was directed by Joseph Rubin. Joseph Rubin has directed. He's a go- he's a gold mine. <laughs> amazing stuff. I I this is not a well known film, but it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, it's James Wood, Robert Downey Jr. lawyer movie called True Believer. So good. It's so good. The the they're they're, um, they're trying to defend Chosen from Karate Kid Part Two. Yep, <laughs> it's totally right. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's great. It's, it's got the dad. I never think of the dad from um, that '70s show. Uh, Red. I can't think of his yep, name. I see he, his face. He's in it. It's. I, I watched it. I have Crackle. Because everyone, because it's free, but it's on Crackle right now, and so I watched it like two weeks ago. Oh, just, I'm gonna go back and watch it. I just it. loved it so good. So he did True Believer. He did Sleeping with the Enemy, which was a Julia Roberts movie. Huge after, movie, huge movie. Julia yeah. Roberts movies after Pretty Woman. Uh, he did The Good Son, great movie. Oh, uh, Money Train, and then Money Train's a great movie. Money too. Train's a good movie, too. and then he did Return to Paradise, which gave us Joaquin Phoenix, and probably Joaquin Phoenix is one of his finest roles until uh, the Joker. Absolutely, and the guy who made Dreamscape did that. Right, so like, that's that's, tr- that's insanity. Uh, it was written by David Lowry. Who uh, also has pedigree. Uh, Lowry d- did, well, you say that and then I start with, he did the story on Star Trek V. <laughs> but he still made a Star Trek movie. Yeah, it's five. Uh, <laughs> he did the 1993 version of Three Mus- Musketeers. He also did Pastor 57. He which did, I love. Which, always been yeah, on black. Yeah, always been on black. You never get that line if we don't have this movie. Uh, it is also, uh, the, so he did the story by, he also wrote the screenplay with Chuck Russell, who d- was the director of Nightmare on M Street 3. Director of the Blob, which was a Frank Darabont script, The Mask, and then he did the Scorpion King. Good and then grief. also that guy like went on too. Yeah, and so and then Joseph Rubin also did did because The Mask was a huge box office. Oh yeah, was, yeah. It was, and Scorpion it was, King was the first rock movie. M Street Three was too. M Street Three was the biggest M Street for a while. It was like the biggest. I mean, it, it did it beat one numbers. Not, I'm gonna pull my Justina card. I've only seen one. We'll do. We'll. It's just not my jam. No, it's okay. Not, not in a negative way. So, I'm not opposed. I just never... <clears throat> uh, one is a classic horror film. Right. Nightmare on Street is a classic horror film. And it holds up in certain ways. In some ways, it it, it it doesn't really follow its own rules, but it's okay. It works. Two is a mess. Uh, but it's weird. And I, when two, even two came out, no, I don't think really a lot of people like it. Now it's more of a, a coming out movie because... It's totally about you know coming out of the closet. And when you go back, when you go back and look at that, you go, oh, I get it. There's a uh, right. yeah. There's there's a scene where the coach is like whipping these kids in the in like a 
like uh, the the showers with you know leather you know you know there's a whole there's a whole bit about that and so I was like oh when I saw it when I was like nine I didn't get it yes my mother made me let me watch movies way earlier than I should have uh, but <clears throat> but that's why you have Scotty now right that's how you get Scotty now so M Street three is uh, kind of a return to the first one they you know it's a whole new set of M, M Street kids and it make and they're all in, in a Kind of a psychiatric ward because oh, no. Oh yeah, I know the plot yeah, of this. Yeah, because That's no right. one believes them because right. and so it was, and they they all have like sleep disorders because Freddy Krueger was trying to Which kill them. Which one's Dream Warriors? Uh, Dream Warriors. That one's Dream Warriors. Oh, okay. So that's with the, with that, the Dawkins song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Lawrence Fishburne's in it as an orderly. You know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and it's 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 a it's a good movie. Four's a fun movie. Fun. Four gets a little fantastical, and there's places in four where you're like, they run out of budget. But if they had budget, this would have been awesome. Yeah. And then after that's kind of a mess, but. Yeah. There's there's a scene in four. They have a uh, a kid who's uh, obsessed with kung fu movies and being you know he practices martial arts and stuff. And so there's a scene in in his dream where he fights Freddy Krueger, but they didn't have the budget left, so he just fights an invisible glove. Oh boy! And so he, you know he's doing his karate moves oh and you and he's got the sounds like he's oh beating Freddy boy. up, but you, there's no crew because they can afford it. They, That's just mm-mm. <clears throat> so. You got to get smarter than that. They didn't, but I love it. I saw that one in the theater, so I love that one. So that you know, sometimes you're just like, oh, Lisa Wilcox is in it. She's really good. All right. So uh, this movie stars Dennis Quaid, who's amazing as Alex Gardner. Mac- <laughs> the, the cast list on this is crazy too. It's insane. But, so Max von S- S- uh, Sydow as Doctor Paul, uh, Paul Novotny, Christopher Plummer as Bob Bob Blair, Eddie Albert as the president, Kate Capshaw. As Jane DeVries, David Patrick Kelly from the Warriors, as uh, Tommy Ray Glattman, George Went, Norm, <laughs> as Charlie. Who, there's a bar scene. There's a bar scene. He's and in they the drink movie. a beer. But of course they yeah, do, because he's Norm. Yep. As uh, Charlie Prince, and then and then Corey Bumper, the others, as B- Buddy. Jeez. I wonder if they just called him Bumper on set the yeah, whole time. Probably. Bumper. And yeah, hey, Bumper. Hey, Bumper. Come on ready for you uh, mr bumper we'd like to see you in first position please <laughs> he's like okay so uh the music in this movie is interesting it's very synth heavy so i was expecting a very synth heavy now let me just so i thought of, this is one of our common dialogues we're okay. both soundtrack horrors right we are and i i, I started listening to it I was like ooh. When it first started, I was like, all right, it's a little dissident, it's a little strange. And then it just turned into like almost like rattling sounds, like some some uh, grandma's drunk at the keyboard. <laughs> I mean, it was just <laughs> random. But it was like she was ha- like so drunk, she was like, <laughs> it was like weird. <laughs> that was even in rhythm. This wasn't even <laughs> this in rhythm. Really good. <laughs> but then, as as you have about to shame me, no, yeah, about I'm to. bashing the heck out of this music. This but. the soundtrack. I it's it's one of the weaker parts of this movie. However, uh, it is done by nine time Oscar nominee, three time winner Maurice Gerrard. And you may ask who he is. He is also David Lean's uh, composer, who did he the award winning composer of my favorite film of all time. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. I uh, did Doctor Zhivago, and then he la- he won his last Oscar for A Passage to India. He also did wrote he did the score. He was nominated for the score for Ghost. Yeah, the guy kills it. Uh, and he, and then just to deepen my heart, he did the score to Enemy Mine. Oh, uh, which is one of my all time favorite films. Which is another. It's Dennis a brilliant Quaid. Dennis Quaid. It's, movie. it's a great movie. It's a great movie. Uh, it was edited by Oscar winner Richard Hazley, Halsley, who dra- who did did the edit on Rocky. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at this. I looked at the editor. I always look at the editor and the DP. Yeah, right. And, and the I, editor and like added to both because I now know that yeah. that's what our show is different than the one upstairs. <laughs> it's true. Um, he did. Uh, he won the Oscar for Rocky. He um, tr- uh, did the edit on Edward Scissorhands and Sister Act. Yeah, the guy's a, like a fantastic editor. Uh, the director of photography is Brian uh, Tofano, who directed the uh, who was the DP on um, the Who's Quadrophenia. He did Train Spotting. He did Billy Elliot. Yeah, again, this movie <laughs> is it is a. That's the weird part. That's why you can't discount any film. That's right, why this right. show exists. <laughs> because when you get into the catacombs, you start to find the truth. <laughs> You're Scully. I'm Mulder. Or you could be Mulder. Okay, I'll be whatever. Scully. You could be Scalder. I'll be Molly. Either way, 
the truth is here, and, and uh, we're bringing it to you. I don't know, right? It's just, I, it's just, it's exactly what we're doing here. I, I was um, flabbergasted when I saw who made this movie, because I look at, you know, I, I'm like most um, film guys for IMDb. I like, I'll look at director or writer or actors, and then I forget about everybody else, and then just start digging into editors and uh, cinematographers and stuff, and then I'm like, oh my god, look what this. And this movie came out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like. I mean- it's it's like last uh, last episode with Jim Cotta. Like there's right. a pedigree in Jim Cotta oh, yeah. that's insane. So, so how would you synopsis this film? Um, a weary psychic goes on a journey to stop a madman from destroying the president. Mine is this: a young psychic is blackmailed by a shadowy government a- agency to participate in an experimental dream travel program. While he's there, he learns of a plot to kill the U.S. president and must use his psychic dream ability to save the day. Yours is pretty good. That's a pretty good one. That's why you're a producer. <laughs> you write the stuff, I just make it happen. I just, I just, I just, I just do my thing. Um, so, when was the first time you saw this movie? Do you remember? Uh, so, it came out in 83? 84. 84. I, I think I probably saw it 87 or 88. And the number one takeaway... <laughs> Not my memory from this movie was Cobra Commander with nunchucks. That's because I think I'd seen the GI Joe movie. Right, right, right. So it was Cobra Commander, right. Cobra Law yeah, Commander, Commander right. with nunchucks. That's what That's I remember. You. And as a kid, I thought Dennis Quaid was Harrison Ford. He's very Harrison Ford <laughs> he's in this very, movie. He's very Harrison Ford, and I didn't think about it until now. Yeah, he's very. He talks just like him, and it's really Harrison Ford from uh, American Graffiti. Right, right. That's probably what he's like. Can you be like? Yeah. <laughs> can you can you do this? Can you do it more like? Yeah. I can see those notes. I saw it at a friend's sleepover, probably in middle school. So it was probably seventh grade. So ninety, eighty nine, ninety. That's when I I'm first. probably in that same space. And so I saw it, and um, they had a copy. They had taped off cable. They were from New York, and so they had good cable. And then when they moved to bumfuck Alabama. There was no cable, so right. they had all these tapes, and that's how they survived. Right, and so uh, he showed me. They're like preppers, you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but just for video tape. <laughs> yeah, that's what. It when the apocalypse comes, we're gonna have some good entertainment. We ain't gonna have food. <laughs> we can't eat. Can't eat, but we're gonna just watch. Be able to trade this limited edition rare <laughs> Star Wars taped off TV. <laughs> Do you remember those? Were like on the, the, the when it came on broadcast. Oh yeah, have, like the little actors would come up and give you a little behind the scenes. Oh stories. yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Um, s- uh, there's a there's a Facebook uh, guy I, I follow called Dinosaur Dracula, and recently he posted the NBC intro to Empire Strikes Back. Oh, I need to see that. And so it's just like you know, it's just the you know coming you know, next is you know, it, yep. but with all those logos and Love stuff it. for the NBC Movie of the Week, and they had the Movie of the Week title stuff going for it. Oh, I need to see that. Remember that in ABCs? ABC, oh, yeah. ABC and NBC always had the best movies. CBS always just One jump. of the most depressing things in the world to me, though, as a kid, was the uh, Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights, because it meant the weekend was over. Oh. And, and, and I mean, I just remember it. So it's the same sort of feeling. I get this weird sort of nostalgia feeling, whenever because Sunday night was the big time to put those movies right, on. Right, right. And it always reminds me of joy and panic at the same time. What I remember most about those movies is that it, that introduced, introduced me to... And at the time, I didn't know it, but it introduced me to deleted scenes. That's because, true. Because they would always add scenes to make, yep, make timing, it, make make the time work out. Because that's how I first saw the um, the gun in the hallway scene for Aliens. Yep, I mean that was on the CBS version. Absolutely right. And so that's you know when that aired, it was like, and then you'd get into the on the video cassette, and you're like. I know I saw yeah. a hallway full of guns. <laughs> I think half the Mandela effect problems come from, <laughs> from the TV edits yeah. versus the reality oh, yeah, yeah, edits. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can yeah. totally see that. But yeah, you know, so there's a lot of a lot of TV edit stuff going on. Um, I was the, I, we just did Jaws two a couple of weeks ago on um, the cult movie Cantina, and there are five or six deleted scenes that we talked about, but those were all TV edits, yep. and there were some of them that were like. They added, but they only added for like TV in Brazil. Yeah, <laughs> there's some strange ones. There's some interesting ones with this. I don't. Did you get? Do you have like any of the ones about Kate Capshaw? I, I, I had. There was. I only thing I saw was the they 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 had a a sex scene they kind of altered. Yes, and, and that for so there's another one uh, regarding the nunchucks. Oh, okay. So in the UK, they were considered to be a very lethal weapon. <laughs> 
So over there, they would cut that kind of violence out. Right. So even so, that entire scene was he does the nunchucks. That whole scene gets pulled out in the UK, and then in 1999, uh, whatever it is, it's not BAFTA, but it's like some acronym. They came back and said, "Yeah, nunchucks really aren't that damn like right, you, can't, right. you can't hurt that many people with nunchucks." I mean, and so they allowed it back in. I'm about to do research, but I don't know the number of nunchuck deaths a year in 1984 was. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> just imagine all the kids. Just it's probably like nutchucks. Where right. There's a lot of balls. Getting I, smashed. I whacked mine and my forehead. Oh I was come on, terrible dude, was, with nunchucks. Yeah. And that's why I never wanted to be Michelangelo. I was more of a Donatello kid. I can handle. I a stick. can handle a stick. I'm you the know, same way. Handle a stick. So we we start this movie and uh, we started on a green screen or a blue screen at the time. It was a red screen. I don't know what it was. It was bad. <laughs> and uh, it's a woman running um, through a city, which is New York, because there's yep. So she's running through New York, and by running through New York, she's running away from New York, right? And what she's running through is like a matte painting of New York, yep. on, That's on a blue screen, and she's overlaid. And the and the and she's like wrapped in black wedges right. around her because right. the, the technology just was, didn't was, exist. Was not yeah. They so bad. It was like this is what we got. Yeah. And, and they were they, it was good. So uh, I could see like I could see where it would be like oh wow look at that I, back then doesn't quite hold up. There's a nuclear explosion and she's swept swept up into it Sarah Connor style. I guess her style it and, was yeah it, it was, was it and, very much was and. Uh, uh, Eddie Albert wakes up from this terrible nightmare that he's having, and then we learn that Eddie Albert's the president, and he's worried about he's got nuclear bombs and he, Russia again. Or oh, we're back to the Cold War. Uh, we're always back to the. It's Cold. gonna be a theme on the show. I guarantee yeah. it. <laughs> There's a lot of Cold War era movies in the eighties. Uh, so he's trying to figure out what he's going to do about that, and he's all worried. And they're going to get him some help because he's got a big summit or something. He's worried about. You know, was a disarm. Then we meet Alex, uh, our our resident Dennis Quaid psychic, who has been using his gift gifts to. Uh, I don't know how to win money at the track. I I never thought like the whole movie doesn't. It, there's outside no of the, there's no rationale for it. <laughs> yeah, though. there's nothing given from this point on that he can see the future. No, <laughs> because if he could, he could see the car coming in the phone booth. Right, like there's a million other things. <laughs> so, but he can pick a winning horse. Like I don't. I just don't understand. That's kind of an awesome mutant power, though. Oh, it's a great mutant power. <laughs> my name, my name is excessive. I don't know what his name would. Be. I'm just coming up with something. But like, I'm the gambler. <laughs> We've already got him. His name is Gambit. Mm. I'll come up with something. I was going to go. We already got him. It's Kenny Rogers. <laughs> no win to fold. <laughs> no win. To... I I used to confuse Kenny Rogers. This is a true story. I used to confuse the <laughs> Kenny Rogers with the Colonel. Like they were the same person to me. They both sold chicken. <laughs> I know, but when I was a kid, pre, I thought the gambler also <clears throat> sold chicken. Can I quickly go off topic because you mentioned the Colonel? Because the greatest commercial of all time has come out? No, they've topped this. Okay, I don't know who's in charge of KFC's ad program. They're brilliant. But I want to either work for them or or just work for them. Yeah. Um, They have a, a new dating sim <laughs> oh, I heard about coming this. out. So dating sims are really big in Japan. And so you know these dating, dating simulator games, and they're they're really huge in Japan. Well, Steam's releasing one. They're releasing one through Steam for free at the end of the month, where it's a dating sim for Colonel Sanders. Yeah, it's and brilliant. it's awesome. It's, <laughs> it's it's awesome. I've already it's on my wish list. When it when it gets here, it will download. I cannot wait to play it. My I I where I got led down that path was I saw a commercial and it was Sean Astin up on the shoulders and I was like, this looks. Wait, that looks like Rudy. <laughs> and then I noticed it was the lines from Rudy. I was like, and there's a bucket of chicken. <laughs> and then it's Rudy too. The he's Colonel Sanders <laughs> now. I think it's <laughs> <his name. laughs> I mean, that's look, you can't come up with that unless you are listening to and enjoy the content that we talk about on this exactly, show. Exactly, exactly. So hopefully their ad agency is listening to us. Please do. Please hire us. We will shamelessly yeah, write copy yeah, for you. We will totally write copy for you. Look at the copy I wrote earlier about Facebook. It's yeah, amazing. It's perfect. Your grandma. <laughs> it's perfect. You're good. Well, so Alex is a gambler, and he's really good at it because he can pick horses with his psychic mojo. And uh, there's some uh, pretty typical non-Italian thugs. Yep. And Irish thugs, maybe. Maybe. And uh, they're like, you're going to work for us now. And he's like, I'm not. And then escapes. <laughs> with the lamest escape. <laughs> you're right, just He throws the bag out the window. Where does money go? In his pocket. He kept the money. 
Oh, you're assuming it was in his pocket. I thought he would have done something maybe a little more clever. But the guys were stupid enough not to even bother to check, check him, right? Because yeah. he, he had the bag still. Yeah. And so, you know, he switched the money out with paper towels or something. Toilet know? paper in the ladies' restroom. Right, in the ladies' restroom. Cause, yeah. So, yay. Yeah. <laughs> and so for he escapes. Um, He goes to his his apartment. But apparently he's well known. Yeah, he's... Didn't that scene happen right before that? Yeah, he's... Like Christopher Plummer's like, I know who we need to get. Yeah, it's, you know, that's right. Yeah, we're we're uh, there's a scene where uh, uh, that's right. There's a scene at the university, and it's Christopher Plummer and Max von Sydow and Kip Capshaw. They're all talking about psychic, and they're showing a uh, video of of uh, Alex, and the, you know, showing that he has a gift, yep. and that they want him for this whatever program. And then then he, we we are introduced to Alex, who is you know the gambler. He escapes, he goes and plays saxophone badly at his house. That is the random, <laughs> random. Sarah walked in right about the time, and she's like, what the hell are you watching? I was like, it's Dennis Quaid playing a saxophone with no shirt on. <laughs> like, I don't know what you want me to do there. At one point, though, quick sidebar, true story about this exact screening. I was looking at Dennis Quaid, and I was like, you know, I kind of feel like I... like." Young Dennis Quaid and I have very similar. I like I was feeling right. kind of good about myself, and my wife was like, "God, young Dennis Quaid was ugly." <laughs> <laughs> like true thing. In my mind, I'm like, I look like young Dennis Quaid, and, and she and just the tears me just goes, down. Aww. That's what she does. <laughs> That's just how she does it. Even inside my brain. Oh, oh Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> she'll kill us all. But she has a deeper catacomb library than some of us. Do. Oh, I have to get her on the show one day. She will do it for the comet. For which one? The movie called The Comet. I've never heard of it, so we'll have to do yeah. it for that. I'm... I think it's called The Comet. It's about a comet that causes zombies. Oh, that's uh, the Night of the Creeps. Night of the Creeps. She yep. just calls it The Comet. Yeah, the Night of the Creeps. She so doesn't we... know titles, oh, but she totally. watches that movie. That and the Burbs Tom... are her two favorite yeah, Tom movies. Atkins is in that. Tom Atkins is in um, the, the main guy in Halloween 3. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> There we go. <laughs> who's, who's booking for him a, a spot in the new Halloween movies? He's like, come on, guys. And Please. So... But uh, <clears throat> so uh, Alex is going to go about his day, and uh, he sees some thugs come up for him. But however, he's lucked out, and there's a car for him, and so he gets in the car, which is an old cab. It's an old cab, and the uh, the car is uh, driven by a mysterious. No, it's driven by uh, Peter Jason, and Peter Jason, who's a well known character actor, but he's in a ton of John Carpenter stuff. Yeah, he's awesome. Yep. And uh, and another random guy who's not nearly as awesome, and so they get past the the thugs, and Alex is all like, "Well, thanks for the ride, but I gotta go." And they're like, "No, no, we're kidnapping you. We're right. basically kidnapping you." And they take him to the university, where he's met by uh, Kit Capshaw, who tells him about the dream program and things. And he's like, "And there's one little sequence where they're walking through, and she's like, security is a big deal here. You never see that guy again. <laughs> like, there's a dude sitting in a chair yeah, yeah. guarding the exact, exact space piece, right. where he just keeps breaking in. And, right, that's further on. But, like, right. that security guard's like, I only work one day a year. <laughs> and it's today. <laughs> right now. No, no, 10 minutes. I'm only here for the 10, 10 minutes, minutes for the yeah. scene. And then I'm out. Union break. Right. And it's like, God, how long is your break? He's like, I'm in the union. <laughs> see, see you next year. Yeah. Um, that's So they walk past the, the guard and this uh, stairwell that's going to wherever he's guarding. And then they have a, they pass another room. This is all the, all the part of the scene I remember. Is they they go to this other room and they talk. They suddenly start randomly talking about sexual dysfunction. Yeah, it was really odd. Like it was it, like, it was like hey oh, guys, by the way, does your dick about, not work? Yeah. And then we can fix like, that. The other <laughs> thing we do here is fix men's pee pees. <laughs> and he's like, oh, it's a pecker. He makes like a dick joke. <laughs> oh no, goes so oh, so you count boners? That's count what he said. You count That's boners. It. You count boners. And so I'm gonna uh, change that to my new name. Can I be <laughs> Count Boner? <laughs> I am Count Boner. <laughs> Who lives in the catacombs? I can see it. Oh, we need a puppet. <laughs> I'm getting a puppet made. <laughs> Count Boner's gonna. You guys will never see it, but if you see us in explicitly laughing, it's because I've broken out my Count Boner. <laughs> and we're no longer a family. And show. We're done. Oh, we have the I E think for. We dropped an F bomb earlier. Right, so. We have the E for explosive anyway on our stuff. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. Um, the other random thing that happens in this scene is that. Kate Catshaw is uh, lured away by a lady who goes, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> and she says yes. And the only reason why she does that is so Dennis Quaid can go sneak off into the gene dream it's chamber. Totally right. And and you can tell it almost feels like Kate Capshaw wasn't totally sure. I, I, I This stood out to me. So when the lady says, uh, doctor, can I see you over here for a second? Kate Capshaw does something with her hands that's kind of a dismissive, like, you're right. annoying me. Right. But then it's like, 
she does it, and then you see it on her face. Right. Oh shit, that's my that's my line. That's and then she walks over. Right. Like, no, you can't talk to me. I'm yeah. acting with Dennis Quaid. Yeah. And counting boners. Wait, what? Yep. <laughs> so she she leaves him, and uh, he goes back to the uh, stairwell where the guard is not guarding, and sneaks. The down. guy's gone right, right away. And we get in this um, danger room style control center. <laughs> And he opens up some lights, and we see two, uh, in, like a soundproof room with really comfortable, like chair beds. Yep. And like, almost like dentist chairs. Almost dentist, like, like dentist, yeah. cha- dentist Quaid chairs. Dentist <laughs> Quaid. Dentist Quaid chairs. <laughs> I can fix your teeth. <laughs> Count boners. <laughs> Count boners. That's what I do down here. Dentist Quaid. Sorry, that's going to tickle me for a while. That's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> why I'm here. That's why I exist. Uh, and you know, he's not supposed to be in there. And so, but Max von Sydow knew, knew he was going to be there. So Max is all like, Hey, come join this program. And it's like, no. And he's like, yeah, the U S government wants to know about that gambling debt you got. Uh, blackmail, blackmail works. <laughs> yep. Done. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. And so the next scene he wakes up in bed and, and it's tidy whitey. What? They're blue. He's got blue indies. He's got those bikini, like eighties. Like, but it's a really random thing, though, right? right. Cause he he wakes up in bed. Right. Max von Sydow's there, it, right? Hanging out. Some needful things moment. <laughs> I was like, what, what long have you been watching him? Yeah, but it's even weirder to me. Or, yeah, that's creepy. <laughs> yeah, right. Just, it's totally. Yeah, I, uh, I played chess with je- uh, with death, and now I'm watching you sleep. It's yeah. so weird. And then. He gets up, he's like, I gotta go to the bathroom. And it's literally an obligatory shot to show that Dennis Quaid has abs. Right, he's got, he's got that lean body. And also the fastest morning pees ever, any yeah. human being's ever taken. He's I mean, like, ding, I'm done. Right, right, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, there's... Maybe he couldn't pee because he had a... Uh, he <laughs> Mike Johnson's not on his house. <laughs> Get out, I can't pee while you're here. I, just, I, if I hear you breathing. <laughs> I can't do it while you watch. <laughs> But how come he didn't know he was there? If he could already see the future, he should have woken up. He was surprised. Because he, he can't see the future. His his mutant power is he can pick horses and go into dreams. That's, that's all he's got. And he does a hell of a good crown job. He's yeah. a dentist after all. He's a dentist. <laughs> he also plays the um the the Peter Vinkman game from the beginning of Ghostbusters really well. He's really yep. good at picking cards and not yep. getting shocked. <laughs> yeah. So. Of course, Kate Cashel doesn't shock him. I was like, "Aren't you supposed to shock them when they're wrong?" Yeah, it's it's bizarre. I have to. We have to talk about the when we get there. I would like oh, to spend a minute on the Kate Cashel scene. We can we can get whatever. It's not not really an order. I'm just talking. Well, I know, but I, just going through the plot. Then he meets the guy from Warriors. <laughs> Come on, playing. So he meets uh, him. Um, and I've already Ray for, Ray Ray Ray. Uh, His name Tommy. Ray? No, it's Tommy Ray. Tommy Ray. Who is also a psychic, and he's probably like their star psychic. Yeah, he's like the tough guy psychic. The tough guy psychic. Oh, real quick, we miss we 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 between these two scenes. There's a scene where um the the one of the psychics is uh dream linking with a boy who has oh, yeah, terrible yeah, nightmares, right. has terrible nightmares, and then just ends up catatonic. He's not well when he wakes up. The boy right. is fine, but the psychic's like, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. So they they had to haul him away over the night. That's what happened. And then uh, Tommy Ray's like all like curious about the new the new fish in the psychic barrel or whatever. So then he just shows up in his apartment though. Well, uh, it's not his apartment. It's it's the dorm room that. They're- yeah, but it's just bizarre. He's like, and he's putting on his clothes. He's like, hey, look at this leather jacket. He pops it on. <laughs> uh, I'm just an asshole. Well, yeah, I just want to make sure like, you know I'm. You're not gonna be around. You're gonna be in a wicker basket the whole time. Though Dennis Quaid's being super nice. Yeah, he's like he's a chill dude. <laughs> yeah, Dennis Quaid is like he's a good dude. Maybe he's popping morphine. Right, he's just chill, just chill. Um, uh, so we establish our villain, yeah. <laughs> and then um, Dennis Quaid does his first dream linking trip with a guy who's uh, as a construction worker who has uh, terrible fears of I don't know if it's heights or he's something something about safety. And yeah. falling off buildings and so he's not there to save someone i think that's what it is and uh we see his dream and it's, and it's interesting because it's the way it's shot so it's this everything looks real except the sky is all messed it's, up the sky's like in a time lapse right and they, it's like yeah, moving really, really quick fa- really quick and it's yeah. kind of made like oversaturated and, it, <laughs> and this is the first major problem aside from the psychic ability with this entire movie go for it so Dennis Quaid tries to save this guy. He's like, the girder! And then he jumps onto the girder with him, and now they're hanging over. Right. Dennis Quaid falls to his death. Right. Which in this movie's world, if you die while you're asleep, 
you die. I think he. I think he wakes up before he dies. Like he had an inception kick? Yeah, yeah. I Which think, we haven't even talked about right, yet. Right, yeah, we'll but, get I, there. but I, think, I think that's what happened. Okay, so I don't he think, woke up before he right, hit the ground. Right, you've had dreams where you f- were falling, and and then you wake it's up. It's the kick, yeah, right, it wakes you, you up. You, you sure. wake, so, so I think he kicked before he woke up. He okay, all right. Either way, though. I will give, I'll give that one. It, it is bizarre that they set up this. But concept. they're excited that, hey, look, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I actually was in your brain. The guy goes, you totally were in my brain. And so they celebrate. Um. The president talks with uh, Christopher Plummer about his dreams and this this stuff, and he's like, "I think I got this program that you can come. We'll have you secretly come to this program, and we'll help you out." He also mentions the president also mentions he wants to end nuclear. Right, he's like, "Yeah, I'm I'm going to go to the summit because I'm having these terrible dreams, and I'm going to run the summit myself." He says, "Yeah, we're running about, and we're going to just we're going to go toward disarmament." And Christopher Plummer's like, "Mm, "Okay, he's not in. He's not really cool with all this disarmament." Apparently he's like a it's he's dark he's like more black ops than CIA right he's like at a whole other level yeah. and like he's been around you know, the the line for him was like you know presidents come and go he's always that Bob Blair's always there yeah Bob Blair stays and so Bob Blair's funding this pro, his his office is funding this project so he's turning into this basically government thing and long story short he's making assassins is really what he's trying to do and right. that's what he's training Tommy Ray to be be this assassin. Tommy Ray's this um, bad kid. He killed his dad. Been in and out of problems, and there's they, not a lot of backstory. He's no, just, just bad guy. Right, killed his dad. Bad guy. Yeah, and, and then we see him. He's kind of a jerk. Uh, there's a lot of hard to get between uh, Dennis Quaid and Kate Capshaw. Yeah, there's a lot of you know that inevitably ends in what I would argue is rape. <laughs> Let's talk about that. So it, it is really bizarre. That scene is really, really bizarre. So he dreamscapes into her dream. Her, her dream, and she's on a train, and it's kind of romantic, and they kind of have a little fling. And which again, precursor to the Tom Cruise risky business move, right? So you're gonna see, learn that all these movies <laughs> trended everything. It else. all connects. It all connects. It's it's uh, seven degrees of um, dreamscape. Yep. And it's <laughs> right. It's always every movie's gonna end up being this way. But uh and then it gets kinda hot and heated and then they wake up and it's like she's uncomfortable and upset. She said you should not have done that. Right. You had no right to do that. It's the it's a weird line. It's a very weird line. In today's day, right, that I don't think that would hold up. Right. Right. That would not get through it would have been and because people are a lot more sensitive and a little right. more he basically like Pardon the expression, but mind f's her. Like he's literally in her brain while she's sleeping. She has no control. She has no consent because she's asleep. You don't. You're not super. I mean, I guess you could argue maybe there's some conscious in it, but yeah, okay. So it's just a really weird. It was very creepy to me to watch. Okay, it. I preface this with I feel it was wrong. Right. Yep. However, it didn't happen. Right, there was actually no, no, it, yeah, nothing, no, no nothing, business change. No business, it, no business. Right. It was, the dentist did not go in her mouth. Right, he he didn't fill up any of her in your cavities. Oh my God. There it was. <laughs> dentist Quaid filled none of Kate and Capshaw's Capshaw's cavities. cavities. He got it. It's our next T-shirt. <laughs> oh my God, dentist Qua- Dentist Quaid is our uh, next T-shirt. That's done. <laughs> I want one right now. You can actually go to tpublic.com opcast network and get our Yakmala shirt. Yes. It's, it's it's already on there. Dentist Quaid is our next shirt. I can't wait. To oh, that's 100% that one happening. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh I so everything happened was just mental and it was like mental asleep. So it wasn't like it wasn't like half the times we see Troy on Star Trek, where she gets literally mind raped. Yeah, there's all, all the bad episodes with Troy is her getting mind raped. Oh yeah, it's and terrible. Nemesis is there's a big plot of her and Nemesis yeah, with that. That's absolutely right. And so, and uh, Mar- Marina Sirtis Sert- would has mentioned it a lot. Yeah. So, why I believe it's wrong, I'm just like, it's still not a thing. It, it on a technical <laughs> like, if you're gonna go Stephen Crowder for the moment, right? Right, the guy who's changed my mind. He Robert, argues on the technical aspect right. of it. Uh, technically, yes, it is not the definition of rape. Right. However, it is a really like it's it could have been handled differently. Right. Like them making out is still kind of like questionable meets. Right. But it still is at least something. This gets to a point of like we're gonna do it. Yeah, but so it's still her dream. 
and she seems kind of into it. Sure. I just don't know. I, I guess the weird part for me is because I don't. I, don't Dennis, I rarely get to control my dreams. There's one or two. Where but, I, yeah, I but I don't think Dennis, Dennis Quaid's like controlling everything. He's not like the dream master. He's not coming. Yeah, but in. he entered it illegally. I guess is my point. Is it illegally? Well, sure. It's it's a private moment that he forced his way in, which is uh, that's where I'm saying it. But but there's no laws for it. you. You can do that. If no, no, I'm. <laughs> Right, the Steven Crowder rule. Right, I'm just technically legal. I'm just saying morally. Morally, it was terrible. I'm just, I'm, but I'm just like it's not going to hold up in a court of law. Is no, what no, I'm saying. No, no. So. She would have no case. Right, Twitter. She'd have a great case. But yeah, on Twitter, <laughs> she's got she it. On Twitter, but Twitter and Reddit, it's over. Again, wrong. He should have done it. I agree. Totally. It just was a weird thing. But it's supposed to set up the romance. That's right. what it was supposed, supposed to, to set do. up. And again, in the '80s, right when it totally set us to the ro- romance yeah. in the '80s. It's like, yeah. It's oh, club days, right. uh, club man or caveman days. Club woman overhead, Head. take woman, mm-hmm. right? right exactly. And that's what he did. He's he like, totally I, did that. he, yeah. We find out that uh, Buddy, the little boy, is having terrible nightmares about a snake man. That sequence is actually creepy. Yeah, the snake man's not and bad. Oddly, very Beetlejuice feeling. Kind of, yeah. The way the sets were, that was a great, well made sequence. Right. And so, uh, Dennis Quaid is wanting to help this poor kid. For some reason, he's about to leave the program a couple of times. And yeah, he's like, it doesn't make any sense. And then he's like, I'll stay to help the boy, which is also creepy. I'm pretty sure the boy is there for an action beat. <laughs> right. Because the, the storyline is very thin. Right. So the kid's just to give us another dream action monster. Right. And, and so, it sets up something, right, but and, right, and, minuscule. And for an 80s monster, it's fine. It's a yeah. giant snake. You know, it's a, it's a man with a giant snake head. Yep. And it's kind of creepy. I mean... It, in the 80s, I think I think when I first saw it as a kid, it was really really creepy. Um, it's it's not as creepy as the president's dream. Yeah, uh, the president has a dream where he's uh, going through uh, a burnt out building. Yeah, and then he's hearing all oh these, that whole the, the sound design the sound on that, that was fantastic. All these little kids are just saying. Think about that like remade. That would be terrifying. Oh god, it was terrifying. Now oh, yeah. it was cr- totally creepy. But the, it was, but the sound design was was great on it. And if I try to play a clip. Not this gets edited out, but the the why did you do it? Oh man! And, and they're dissident. They're you're, all out of phase. Right. I mean, it, it's really well made. And you got to think that's probably not a lot of computer work, right? Any. <clears throat> no, so that's a lot of tape stacking. Yeah. That's dudes laying layers <sighs> of physical film to me. It's beautiful, right? Just oh, it makes me happy. I'm glad I don't have to do that, but I respect it. I love, I love it, it. Yeah. And then he opens the door and has all these burnt like. I paused it just to see the makeup. I, on it. it was yeah, good. The makeup was great. These yeah. burnt out nu- post nuclear war children, and he wakes up and that's when he's like, "I got to, we got to do some of these dreams, and I'm going in, in nuclear war." Um, Dennis Quaid is, um, meets George Went, who is a, a science, he's a science fiction horror writer. So yeah. he's he's the, this world Stephen King. And he's working on a book about. People going, people, you know, people going into yeah, dreams. He's like caught wind of this. He's caught wind yeah. of it, so he's working on this book, and so uh, he's like, "Yo, yeah, Bob Blair," and he's the one who's like, "Bob Blair's behind it, and he's the bad guy, and he's yep. doing this and this and this." So he's he's there for exposition. Yeah, he's totally. I mean, he's wasted. <clears throat> yeah, and George Went is not. He's not funny in it. No, he's, it, he's very like. No, he's straightforward. And, and yeah, and which I think you know, Cheers would have been on for a few years. A oh, he's years. a total what we would call a stunt cast, right? I mean, not as a stunt per- person, right? Stunt casting, like you take a familiar face and you just throw him in. So, so like they did in, well, they put him in house. Too. George Went was in house. Yep. And then the other guy, um, not he? playing Norm, not the the, yeah. the mailman, I got Cliff, uh, Cliff, yeah, uh, I see his John Rat- Ratzenberger. Yep, thank you. Was in house too. Yep. And in and the, I'm obsessed with. I love the concept of house too. Right, but the best story in house too is that guy. Yeah. And we don't get that movie. No, I'm an electrician and adventurer. I'm like, yeah. I want that movie instead of what we got. Yeah. So house. We'll talk about it in our house two episode. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be as well, preluded in our <laughs> dreamscape episode. Um. So. So we know now. Know something shady coming up. Uh. Uh. There's an old lady who's having a dream. Bad. Bad time. Oh no no. Hold on, let me let's get back to it real quick. There's one thing we we forgot. The guy with the sexual dysfunction, because the, you know they mention it and they have to show oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah, it's so weird. It though. is the it is the save the cat moment of the movie. Yep, <laughs> it totally is. And so they talked about sexual function, and so they have this, you know, really weird like 
nerdy Jewish looking guy. He's yeah. like, you know, like, and, and not like 80s Jewish guy. He's almost Hasidic. <laughs> no, it's very much a, like, like a stereotype well, like, of a. We're, we're picking a yeah. stereotype, and he's got a hot wife, and right. they're having problems, and he's having anxiety dreams. And so. And she's also, I picked up that I, I felt like they, weird choice, but they, not weird, but they made her very dominant. Oh, yeah. And, and so it would put more pressure on him, I right. guess, to perform or whatever it might be. And she's, I mean, she's 80s hot. Oh, she was 80s hot. Yeah, she's 80s hot. Like, but I like, looked at her and was like, ah, oh, that reminds me of, like, nothing. <laughs> We're going to skip that story for later. <laughs> but, uh, so we go in his dream, and it's, he's basically just like... I actually liked his dream. I, I just, it was it's, fun. Fun. it's a really funny moment in the movie. Him and Dennis Quaid drive up to his house, and Dennis, he's all working. He's like, she's sleeping with everybody, and sure enough... He gets in there and he's sleeping with his brother. She's sleeping with his brother in front of her kids. I like how she's like, "You made and the kids, yeah, yeah." I like, and you make the kids watch, and they're just sitting obediently, like in kindergarten chairs. Oh, it's amazing. It's, a, and it's then, very uncomfortable in a good way. Right, right. It's funny. It's it really funny. Right. There's and there's like three people under the bed. He names all them. There's a there's a preacher who's uh, you know, they count behind yeah, the, the, curtain. the priest, but and then and and, and then the Fuka. Fuka. Uh, I forgot the the Asian gardener. Yeah. And he's like, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's like nothing but stereo. It's like a it's dream just, full of stereotypes. It, yeah. It was, it was, Which I guess technically you could still get away with because it is, it's back to the right. the rape situation. This is like a false narrative. Right. right? It's a this false narrative. Real. Right. Um, think about this though. Oh, I'll talk about it later. No, no, go think, ahead. Go ahead bring no, no. It, it was as if we uh, remade. All right. I've got oh, an idea for the remake. Oh, okay. That's, so that's the end of the show. Uh, then stuff happens. That's really unimportant. It's pretty boring. There's a huge chunk There's of There's a boring. chunk of this. this uh, the Which is supposed to be uh, like intrigue, but it's, it's just it's, really it's not. Right, right. It's just stacked. And uh, we basically find out that Tommy Ray can kill somebody in a dream. He's figured out how to do that. And so they get the president you know, the, to, to, in this program, and they're going to have him sleep near uh, in this one room. Tommy Ray's going to go sneak in and, and sleep and kill him. Uh People start unraveling the mystery, and the, the, uh, the and then people start dying. Mike Sancido's killed. Bob Blair's killing everybody left and right. And Dennis Quaid and Kate Cashall's on the run for a little bit, and they're run from government agents until they uh, make it back to the university. And I have so here's the thing. So this is what we are told. This the president's in this room. There's a whole big scene about we have to put the president in this room. Yep. And then we have the killer in the next room. Right. All right. And then we have Kate Catshaw who says, "Oh, the president's office, the president's room is below my office." Yeah. So Dennis Quaid and Kate Catshaw goes back to her office, and he's at first he stretches up and tries to touch the ceiling to Dream Link, and he can't do that, so he lays down, which is because I'm like, you, you're if you're asleep, you're not gonna that that don't work. It just sorry, horse boy, that doesn't work. Nope. So he lays down and sleeps. Now remember that. Just hold that thought. They are, she is below his office, and the guy's in the next door. So we have we, we have a relation with where they're, where they're at. Important. We go to Eddie Albert, uh, President Eddie Albert's dream. He's on a train going through Washington after a, a very, very, I'm colorblind, and it's a very, very red-orange. It's so red-orange. Like, I was like, oh, that, so that's what red looks like. Oh, yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> like, it is, a, it is a tribute to you, sir. Right, right, it's very, very, very red. And um, Eddie Albert's watching the, the destruction and the devastation and just feeling bad about himself because he did this. And Dennis Quaid shows up and he's like, no, Mr. President, I'm here to save your day because I'm Harrison Ford. And yeah, it's exactly <laughs> get off my train. Get off my train. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. That would be good. I'm, I'm also uh, a dentist. I like <laughs> licensed three states. <laughs> dentist <laughs> Quaid. We're, we're, we're going to the fourth. <laughs> we got to figure out how to tie cousin Randy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Keep him in Canada. Yep. Um, then uh, Tommy Ray shows up, and uh, there's a ticket take. No, he's like no, he's a police guy. Yeah, police it's officer. Totally cop. Like, hey, so again, Inception ripped this off. Right. That's the guards inside your brain. Right. right? Like that's. But he's a terrible guard. <laughs> but he's an awful guard. <laughs> and he's like, son, you can't be here. And so. Uh, Tommy Ray totally Temple of Dooms him. <laughs> yeah, but he grows like saber tooth claws, That's, like the X-Men. And they're very villain. silver. They're very silver. And he's like, and pulls out his heart, his right. beating heart. <laughs> he um um shabai um um show Kalima Kalima Kalima, which is he Kalima, which was great. And then he shows off the heart, which I posted in the 
Yeah. Uh, as a as a as a uh, captain. God, he has a terrible line right there. Did you happen to remember it? No. <laughs> I don't remember what it is. It's a terrible line. I, I, I there's lots to, of terrible lines. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> God, it's so bad. There's an Oscar winner around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and then he's he, he's like, "Hey, Alex, you can do whatever you want in this dream." You know, and that's what I figured out. And so he he makes the train goes go fast and it goes in a tunnel, and then he makes uh he makes himself look like he's a burn victim. Yeah, uh, and, and then they that reprise them good makeup. Right, right. Pretty good special effects. Right, he did this to us, yeah. and uh, he has a moment where he's a he's a martial arts expert with uh. At first, I thought they were lightsaber nunchucks. <laughs> I was very excited, and then I was very let down. I was like, oh, my God, I've never thought. Wait, how would that work anyway? I, I don't know, but I, was, I watched them, and they lit, lit up a little bit. or they were, I don't know if they lit up or reflected in the light. I, couldn't, I, I think they were glowing. I think there was some kind of post in that, but I yeah. couldn't quite figure it out. But he yeah. doesn't really do a lot with them. No. Um, the, the They get off the, the heroes. Get but off. that's the scene I remember as a kid. Oh, yeah, because it's, it's great. Yeah. The nunchuck scene's great. Uh, Dennis Quaid and the president get off the train, and they they run through the ruins. They end up and in they're some, chased by these dogs with red eyes. Yeah, these dogs with red eyes. One of them, which stops and gets electrocuted for like a good thirty seconds. But he, he does not get electrocuted. He just gets disintegrated yeah. like it was Star Trek. It was, <laughs> it was awesome. Really, it was so bizarre. It's like I didn't know that that could happen. You can yeah. you can disintegrate a radiated dog. Yeah, yeah, it was bizarre. I loved it. Uh, and then then uh. Tommy Ray decides to turn himself into the steak monster to chase everybody. Cause, well, because the only other thing that we did miss right. is that Dennis Quaid, after saving Billy, right. or Buddy, whatever his name is, turns around and tells uh, Tommy Ray, yeah, Billy Ray, whatever yeah, his name is, was the, that I'm afraid of the snake guy. Mon- right. And so he's like, oh, I can turn myself into the <laughs> and snake. And so he becomes so the snake. So Tommy Ray snake. The makeup's different because it's got Tommy, yep. Tommy Ray's face on it. And uh, they the, the, he chases them basically into a dead end so Dennis Quay's like I got a stick here here's a crowbar and a flaming stick here and I'm gonna go fight so it's the beginning it's the poster yep and, so and he gets bit by him he gets bit by him and that's like our big that's like the big supposedly in a film right that's right that's that moment where we're like oh no all is lost the hero can't overcome these insurmountable odds of a dream snake bite. <laughs> and then like two seconds later, he's way, like, which, but we, the, the only thing that we established that the snake bite could have do, because we did nothing, because there's nothing about a snake bite. Now in Billy's dream, when Billy and Dennis Quaid go fight the snake guy, we meet Billy's dad. And the best line is like, Oh, he won't help us. Yeah. And then the next thing you hear as they run away is him being eaten a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally it. So, so okay. So we know the snake man eats things, and that's about it. Uh he's so he's bitten. The president's trying to save himself, kind of. But you know, he's he's. Well, I'm the president. I'm going to go do my presidential thing. And then we get it back to a, to a close up on Dennis Quaid's shoulder, who magically heals. Right. Because it's not real anyway, so I don't know why we needed them. I don't know. Eh. I, I didn't know why we. That's the that's the character turn, right? right? In right. a classic trope, right? That's, I realize I do have the power, power to right. defeat the and evil. So, and so, and he, he turns himself into his uh, Tommy Ray's dead dad because earlier in the in the exposition <laughs> part of the film, they were like, "Oh, we found all the murder files and stuff that that they just have." Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's like, "Tommy Ray, Tommy Ray, why'd you do it? I love you, Tommy Ray." And Tommy Ray turns around, and is like, "Daddy." <laughs> He gets real southern. Suddenly. He really does. <laughs> He's like, Daddy? No, not Daddy. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes half snake monster, master, right. which was pretty good was makeup. Right, great man. Precursor to enemy mind looking makeup. Right, right. Yeah. By a year. Um, Daddy? And then, then the president just jacks him in the back of the head with a spear. It was awesome. Yeah, and, but it's a very quick, it's almost anticlimactic watching it. Right. But I'm glad it was the president who did it because it's his dream, and he's right. the one who should be the hero of his own dream. And right. I like and it was a good note. That was a good note. It's a was, good, it was very well done. Oh yeah, he looks like he yep. so like when he gets stabbed, it got, cuts back to you know Tommy Ray in his bed. He, he does the the like I've been stabbed because yeah, he dies in his dream, dream. and so jeez, oh, it worked for me. And so here's here's why why the positioning of the rooms made no sense for the next thing because they forgot. It's really yeah. what happens. So uh, Alex wakes up. He's like, we saved the day, but we got to get, get the hell out of here. So they leave, and they run out the front door where they're met by the president in the limousine. They're in the same building is yeah. what I'm trying to say. They're in the <laughs> same. He'd have to go downstairs and then yeah. go like in a bag and then turn around and then like, let's go. Let's drive to the front. And it's, like, it's just a throwaway. 
Oh, there must have been something cut there. I had to be because I'm like, she's just maybe like plumber chases or whatever his name is. Right, yeah, Bob Blair. Bob Blair chases him or something. There's right. got to be some but element I, there. To I, my brain, especially in bad movies, fixates on like just the. Oh no, it's terrible. Right, because like there's a lot of dumb stuff in this movie, and I dumb stuff with a big heart because I love this movie. But there, there's a lot of dumb stuff in this movie, and yeah. then like the minor things, like. Well, you know what's interesting though, geographic. When I mean that is like in a movie when you're building a scene, right? The geography of a scene is actually the biggest thing that that I, you can have bad sound, you can have bad moments in right. it. Right. But if the scene is blocked poorly, and right. the Sequence doesn't work. It stands out worse than all that stuff. And see, which is what is right. exactly and happening. The, in and this. the only re- and, and the only reason why I care about any of this is because they explicitly spell this That's all what I'm out. Saying. They set it up. They set right. it up, and I'm like, yeah. huh. So that tells me there must have been, I, I mean, right. benefit of doubt here that there was something. Right. So the day is saved. There's, It's kind of anticlimactic at the end, except with the exception of, you know, they're worried about Bob Blair getting away. And Bob Blair doesn't get away because Dennis Quaid kills him. Yeah, he straight up murders the dude. <laughs> so, you know, there's a... Not in a nice way. Right. You know? Like in the next scene is like, oh, we won't worry about Bob Blair. And then... We see Bob Blair going into his office, and he open, you know, gets on the elevator, and Dennis Quaid's waiting for him. Then he turns into a giant snake and kills him. Yeah, and that's the end. And then he dies of a heart attack in his bed. Yeah, and then the end is. Th- and there's a weird gag here. There's a weird gag. So, uh, Cape Cashel and um, maybe that's their answer that it wasn't rape. It's was the future. <laughs> and Dennis Quaid get back on a, get on this train in real life to go to L- Louisville because reasons, and there's a track. He's going back to his gambling. Ways. He's going to the uh, the. The Kentucky Derby. Right, he's going to the Kentucky yeah. Derby. And so they get in their little sleeper suite where they were at, and the door opens, and the ticket taker is the same ticket taker that was in the dream. Right. And, so, and she's never been on a train before. It's weird. And yeah. it's like, it's like And they give a look, and uh, then the well, movie ends. They're like, oh, look. Uh, and, then, and I was like, I don't know. And it ends with happened. like really weird over saxophone uh, love music. Very bizarre. <laughs> really, the ending of this movie is... Yeah, it, it's a really... <laughs> Just like Jim Cotta was, right. like it's another one of these movies where it just they don't really close anything out. They, I mean, they do. Oh no, no. they close more out in this than they did in Jim Cotta. Oh, yeah. Jim Cotta, they just closed out. Like they're just like <laughs> and like, and then we got the Star Wars program. Yeah, We're good. Yay! Uh, this they close out more, but it's still kind of abrupt and it's very, it's very like third act problem, right? Uh, which was a problem back in the eighties, and nineties. Yeah. A lot of third acts are terrible. Right. Um, the Rock is another movie that I can't stand. The third act. Right. I mean. They wasted everything in the third act on the dream sequence. That's it. And then after they got out, they were like, where do we go from here? Because yeah, they were totally kind right. of... Pretty I mean, much the whole movie was based on the dream sequence. Right. The because, ending one. Right. Because, you know, they they established the two bad guy rule in that. And so they had like, well, we've killed the main bad guy, yep. but the the puppet master behind it can't get away, can he? Right. Because they're, they're, not, they're not thinking sequels at this time. No. Because there wasn't one, but that, but, but you know, there's a time where all we, we're always now thinking of sequels, or of course, or we're writing everything in trilogies. What's the Dreamscape universe? Right, what's the Dreamscape? The universe? DCU. Oh, the DSCU. I don't. They, know what I'm they could totally give that to me. I would write. Oh yeah, but, but you have a knack for that. I just oh, I would love to. I, w- I would I would try to do it. I would try to get it away from. I don't know what studio has it, but get it to New Line and mix it with Nightmare on the Street. Oh, I'd be all in. <laughs> See, you've already fixed it. <laughs> you've already fixed it. All I was going to say earlier in terms of this, of like, are we on the remake section? No, no, we're not. We'll save okay. it. But um, so, thoughts about this film? Oh, uh, again, it goes back. There's so much in this. Like now, we look at it and, and we have Inception, right? But truly, this movie was the exact idea as Inception, not the assassination part, but the idea of entering dreams and altering those dreams. There's so many themes that are in this that. I'm sure Nolan has seen this movie. Had to. I don't think he was intentionally ripping no, it no. off. But there's some blatant, they did it first. Right. It happened in Dreamscape. It totally existed. And there's tropes that are from that that have gone on forever. Uh, I also wonder what level of green screen this was for actors. Because Star Wars had, had been out. Right. And there's green screen used, but that was all models and props. And there's a lot of red screen, actually. That was so blue screen. They use a lot of blue screen, too. Yeah, red and blue. Cause, red cause, is for effects. But but because they did, because I know. Like the speed break chase is on blue screen. Yep. And so there's some actor stuff in that. Yep. But it wasn't a lot. No, it wasn't yep. a lot. So I'm wondering if this is like another, you know, a lower budget movie because I don't think the budget on this was real high. So I, I, I didn't, I, I've, and maybe it's because I'm colorblind. I never knew about red screen. So red screen's for special effects. Yeah, it's a lot of times for VFX. So, yeah. so is it is there a reason because of the color? Or they just like we need. No, to- it's because a lot of times like if there's a if there's a 
a lot of times he'll do red for like passes, very specific passes. And in fact, one day if Horst comes home, we should have him on. A oh yeah, totally. Point. But it's like VFX passes. So like if you're doing like the explosion mat pass, that's what you, it's. It's all technical stuff. Oh cool. Yeah, I like that. So no idea. So you'll learn something every day. And or if the costuming requires it, mm-hmm. like for some reason they're in blue. Obviously that doesn't work. And green doesn't work really well with blue either. Right. So red just gives you that guaranteed pull. Cool. Yeah. Learn something every day. Nice. Yep. Nice. Very cool. They don't use it much anymore though. No. King's oh. got way better. Yeah. So, even just normal Premiere King's got a whole lot better. It's um, about a million times better. Than right. <laughs> so, Your iPhone can do a better job, job. knocking out the background than than the movie Dreamscape. Uh, but so the story elements, I actually love the idea of we're taking like an MK Ultra sort of crazy uh, CIA run operation. I like that kind. Of, I mm. like Cold War stories. Oh yeah. So I love. I think. It, I think on that. I think it on that aspect it does work. It. I buy. I buy most of this film. I what I especially with the secret government agency yeah. and the the you know in government agency plot to kill the president. Yeah. And I, I'm all in. I'm all in on it. And that. I like the fact that that and and maybe I missed it, but I thought they said if you die in your dream you die. I think Max von Sydow has that line. I like the fact that what they did say is when uh, Buddy Ray, <laughs> no Tommy Ray is going to go kill. He says uh, use a psychic knife. Whatever that means. Right. The point is, is that he is doing something to that person. Right. He is literally committing a murder. Right. And it's not that they dreamed death themselves to death. Right. They literally were murdered. Right. And he's love been, it. Yeah, because his whole thing, he's been practicing in the dreams. To I, I actually love, I love that idea. Dennis Quaid was just kind of hanging out and then killed a snake man. <laughs> yeah, it's just bizarre. He's, a, he's like, he's like a, a very reluctant hero. Right. Um, it's the classic. Yeah. 80s man. I mean, so. that's what he is. So here's some trivia for you. Kevin Costner was offered the role of Tommy Ray. It's insane. But he turned it down because he didn't want to play a supporting role. That would have been not good. <sighs> that was a good call. Good call. Good call. Was the second film to be rated PG-13? Oh, I didn't know that. Under the new MPA uh, AA uh, rating guides, uh, Falling Red Dawn, which came out uh, weeks prior to this. Uh, Wait, Red really. Dawn was the first one? Red Dawn was the first so one. So I've often heard it was always Temple. Nope. Temple's wow. in there, but it's uh, Temple's the next uh, later that year. Interesting. And so, uh, Cape Cashel started as a love interest, and not one, but two 1984 movies that featured a scene where a man still beating heart was ripped up from his t- chest. This and the just aforementioned Temple of the Doom. That's brilliant. I had no idea. <laughs> so, I knew it was '84. I just right. didn't think about it. That's true. So, there's an interesting story out there. If you want to Google this, there's a guy. It was posted in Time. There's a guy who's talking about Inception. This is like in 2005 or 2006. And he's talking about the movie Inception, but he's talking about sitting next to a someone going into production on the movie that he thought was a sequel or remake of Dreamscape. <laughs> it's an article out there. I'll find it. Uh, maybe right. I'll send it to you for the show notes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Dreamscape. Dreamscape uh, released August 17th, 1984, just a few days before my birthday. Oh. That would have been... Seven. <laughs> uh, opening weekend was two point two million. Its domestic gross was twelve. Two million bucks in the eighties, though. That's like a mid range. So, with two million dollars, where do you think it ranked in the top top ten? Ooh, of for the, the for that weekend. How to do its weekend? Oh, I think it was probably like three or five. Uh, I'm gonna say three. Three, nine. Really. So number one was the Clint Eastwood movie Tightrope, which I have never seen. I, never, I don't. I don't actually know that movie. Followed by Red Dawn. Oh. Then um, Ghostbusters, Purple Rain, Revenge of the Nerds, The Karate Kid. Listen to that list of <laughs> yeah, movies yeah, it, all it, out at the same time. Eighty four was so good. The Woman in Red, Sheena, and then Dreamscape, followed by Gremlins. Wow. Cloak and Dagger is also in the Cloak and Dagger was twelve. <laughs> wow. The budget for Dreamscape. You want to take a guess? Uh. Or do you have the production budget? I don't numbers? have it in my hands. Uh, production budget numbers. Eleven million. Uh it's a little bit higher than 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 it would be. I was trying to do eighty four number number, so how much So that's close. If if you think about it, it yeah. would be it's six million. So eighty four nowadays, okay. that would have been a twelve million dollar yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's not bad. It's a low budget movie that got a release, basically. So in the year, how do you think it ranked in the top one hundred? Ooh. I gave you a hint. It's, it is definitely in the top one hundred. Uh I'm gonna go with God. 84 is rough. There's a lot of good stuff. There's so many. We just listed. I'm so gonna many. go with uh, 63. 70. You were really close. Yeah. Uh, the top five movies. You want to take a guess? Of that year. Of that year. E. T. It's gotta be. No- e. T. was 82. Oh. Oh, Ghostbusters. I mean. 
Number two, you're right. Uh, number two. Oh, wait. Is there a Back to the Future out then? No, that's 85. Dang it. So, you, so far, you got one. You just named them all during the summer movie Some playback. of them I did name, yes. Whatever. Yeah, Red Dawn's not one of them. I no, it one. was not. It was a bomb. Top five movies from 1984. Beverly Hills Cop, Ghostbusters. Oh, my gosh. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. People forget I mean, Eddie, how big Eddie Murphy was. Yeah. Just, Think just, about 1984 is maybe one of the biggest years. I would argue 84 and 89. 89's Batman. Batman, Lethal Weapon 2. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. Jurassic Park, 92? 94. 94. Yeah. So. I don't know that year. We'd have to look at that year. But uh, So Gremlins is number four. Oh, my God. The Karate Kid is number five. I'll, I'll, let me just do the top ten because these are fun. Police Academy, number six. Footloose, Romancing the these Stone. These are all gold mines. Star Romancing Trek the Stone's an interesting that it made it in there because it doesn't hold up and it's never been remade. Right. Uh, Star Trek. I love Romancing the Stone, though. Oh, it's great. Uh, Star Trek three: The Search for Spock and then Splash. Splash. Think about that. Like, but, I mean, really? We keep going. Purple Rain, Amadeus. Oh, it's Gray, gold. Greystroke, <laughs> 2010. Greystone? Yeah, Greystroke. I used to, that's the one with the apes or whatever. Right. So it was, it was no, a, no, Greystroke, the legend of Tarzan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was uh, like let's a see, meme. 2010 is number seven. <laughs> Here's something that I didn't know. 2010, which I love, the year we make contacts, a sequel to 2001. Yep. And outside of its place in history and scope, I enjoy 2010 better. Uh, <laughs> it's a, there's a story there. Um, it, it It's number 17 in the year, year list. It made more money than The Terminator, which was 21. That's mind-blowing. Oh. Friday 13th, four is on this list. Nightmare on Elm Street, Passage to India. Uh, which is the uh, the never ending stories on this? <laughs> never ending story. What's which is the romancing the stone with Ice Pepe? Pirates. Which one? Where he's like, and this is Pepe, and Pepe's like a, a kind of badass truck. No, that's the first one. Yeah, I love that scene. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. There's yeah. some great moments in that movie. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great movie. It reminded me of uh, I watched it recently. What's the what's the um, I see his face, African Queen. Kind of reminds me of like the African yeah, Queen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Douglas is very Humphrey Bogart now. Yeah, it's very much that vibe. Yeah. So, how would you with Dreamscape? How would you make it today? I don't want people to think that I just take movies and make comedies, but in this case, <laughs> I do think it would make. And when I say a comedy, I want you to think comedy in the vein of like Spies Like Us. Right. Serious plot line, but you could put a little more humor into it. Right. Because the bo- not the boner scene, but the uh, the guy's sexual right, fantasy right. or whatever. There, his, there's room for humor in this. There's film. a lot of room for humor that needed to be in it. There could be nice little moments of hijinks leading right. into it. Um, I would say that if I were to recast it, you know, in modern terms, yeah, yeah. one of the things that really stood out to me, I didn't realize how much Christopher Plummer, dressed the way he was, the right. way he performed, reminded me of John Hamm. Oh yeah, John Hamm would be great in this. He'd be amazing in this role. Oh yeah, totally great. Um, see, you have John Hamm. Who would be? Who would? Uh, Max von Sydow. He'd be. Uh, that one's trickier because I keep going back and forth on like who do I cast in it that's, you know, like if I'm stacking it, I'm like, oh, you know, just throw old Patty Stewart in there. But then he's too old, I think. Right, I think he is too. You you want someone who's like 50s who could be a college professor, like, yeah, you know, who's dig into it, yeah. Dig, in, dig into it. So there's, I mean... There's actors. There's, oh, there's actors. Who's, who, who's your lead, though? Did you get someone new? No, yeah, I would get an unknown guy. I, I, think, unknown. You need to, I think you need the threat level. That's, um, that's midnight. Good. I got you. If you don't... I'm I'm obsessed with that. I was always obsessed with that, but it's right. really it's really hard to make. Maybe that's why I like a lot of these smaller movies because so, no one knew who these people were. So I I alluded to this before, but here's my version of this. Yep. I mix this with I, I'm gonna follow you. I, I'm gonna combine two movies, two franchises. Love it. So I mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street and Dreamscape. So basically, this is Nightmare on Elm Street three with with psychics who were helping kids f- go through their. I nightmares. think it's fantastic. I mean that's. It's 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 already there. So you have you have a list of patients and a list of crazy dreams, and then you have your psychic killer, your Freddy Krueger. Well, what's cool is you could do the observational thing first, right? Right. Like they're observing, right? And right, and they're starting to see this pattern right. emerge, <clears throat> and then they have to kick ass, right? Like, the one thing I I think I remember a little bit of three, which is don't they kind of go to toe to toe with Freddy? Like they figure out they can fight back, <laughs> sort of. They think they can. Oh, there's a lot of that. There's yeah. There's a. Uh, the, the maybe that's all what I always wanted was them to fight. Yeah, right. The, the, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> the Dream Warriors what the idea of getting their powers are, are kinda cool, but when they when it comes to actual execution of them, we learn that Freddy's truly the king of Nightmare World. Right. And so he can he can nothing's really affecting him except 
in that movie, in case it's things that happen in the real world that stop Freddy. Yeah. So everything they can look cool and whatever in the dream world, but they're kind of useless. And then yeah. it's you know it's whatever's going on trying to stop Freddy in the real world is what what wins that wins the day. Yeah, it's a good movie though. It's a, it's it's one of the better. But it's a great friends. idea to combo but, the two. Yeah, you I combo the two. You and even if you look at and get the franchises together, that's what you do. You have some. I would, I love the killing the president um, <laughs> plot line, um, but I think you can do without it. You can you you can have, you can train a psychic killer in this film. Oh yeah, for sure. And then your sequel, because you know we think in sure. threes, your sequel is you and send you can him. Call out. it Mind Hunter. Right, Mind Hunter. <laughs> I think that's uh, taken on Netflix. Oh, darn it. David Fincher is out there if he's, he's listening. Yeah. Dear David. Would you like some facts about dreams? Yes, let's do it. You dream for- fact. <laughs> Number one, you forget 90% of your dreams within five minutes of waking. That's fact. <laughs> I, don't remember, I don't remember And it's, it really sucks when it was a good sex dream. Yeah, right. And it's like, wait, just hang on one more, more second. Time, and the oh. fades. Um, the blind dream. Those who lost their vision st- uh, still see images in the dream, but those who've never had sight dream, it, but it involves their other senses, so they dream in sight, seeing, and stuff. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I know. have no idea yeah, about that. I mean, it makes sense to me. Which but, also would go really good in your movie. Right. Yeah. makes sense to me, but I never, you know. Uh, in our dreams, we only see faces that we already know. Our mind is not uh, inventing faces in our dreams. We see real faces of real people that we have seen during our life, but may not know or remember. We've all seen hundreds and thousands of faces, though, in our lives, so we have an endless supply of characters for our brain to utilize in our dreams. Brilliant. I love it. I absolutely love it. Not everyone dreams in color, but more people are dreaming color as uh, as we enter into the future. So in the past, more people were dream- dreaming in black and white, but since the invention of things like color television and things, we dream in color more. That's fascinating, because like, that was a whole thing. Like, right. Do you dream in color? But yes, I do. Like, right. And, right. But yeah, so. Brilliant. You have four to seven dreams a night. Animals dream too. And then here's the my favorite thing is you're paralyzed during your dream. So when you're dreaming, you can't move. As, uh, REM sleep is characterized by paralysis of the voluntary muscles. The phenomenon is known as REMatonia and prevents you from acting out in your dreams while you're asleep. Uh, basically, uh, basically because m- motor neurons are not stimulated, your body does not move. There are cases where that happens and you wake up. That's called parasomnia. I've had it. Oh, I've had it too. Parasomnia. It uh, is freaking terrifying right so you so you're still twice right you're still dreaming you can't move um a lot of people who are skeptics of alien abductions believe that's alien abductions. Uh, i am i'm i'm really on the teetering line that that is a lot of fact so in my situation i woke up with sleep paralysis wide awake and i could not move and my dog god rest him was in the room with me and i could talk to him right and he could talk to me right right but that little weird link was my brain starting to put together. That's, but I thought there was someone in there with me, right? And I kept telling him to help me, like I, rem, you know, in my head I'm saying it, right? But you're freaking out because I can't. The words aren't coming out of my mouth, right? And so it was. It talked me down. The second time I had it, I woke up. I freaked out because it is weird. And like 10, 15 seconds of being awake, I was like, oh, I'm having sleep paralysis. And I fell right back asleep. Right. Like as soon as I acknowledged it, I was out. I've probably had it a few times before. But I, the one I remember most is uh, I was high school maybe. I was sleeping in um, bed. And I, of course, because it's sleeping. But I woke up and I saw this abnormally large spider. Oh, crazy. And I was, But I was awake. I saw it. And I saw right. it crawling on my ceiling. And that, and I couldn't move, and then I used whatever willpower I had to, to wake up and move, and then I started looking for the spider, because I thought it was, I swore it was there. Right. I thought it was real, and what, and, but of course, that dawns on me, oh, I was still dreaming. Okay, gotcha, and then I went back to sleep. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird sensation. Oh, it's it really bizarre, is. bizarre. It's very unnerving. But Yeah. But it would make a cool, again, another tie into your movie. Right. To bring that kind of stuff in. <laughs> so, you know, just, you know, just saying. You know, we have good movie ideas. The studio just needs to give us money. Well, <laughs> half of that, they're just ripping us off. <laughs> they're just, stealing our ideas. They'll like, just take you it. guys listen to this week's podcast, they gave us seven ideas. <laughs> I really like the Dentist Quaid movie. <laughs> At least we'll make money off the t-shirt if he's you will dentist, buy it. He's, he's an adventurer. Be... He's Dentist Quaid. Dentist Quaid. What, Cousin Randy? Nope. Nope. nope no Cousin Randy. No, nope. Cousin Randy has to straighten up. <laughs> cousin Randy's cuckoo <laughs> for Cocoa Puffs. He's I think he's in the United States now. For a while, he's hiding out in Canada. I think, I think. he got imprisoned. No, th- I think he's out. I don't oh. think, but I think because they arrested him. But I well, you can't hold the guy who saved the United States from alien attack. That's true. You can't. You can't. Um, I, th- I, th- I don't think. I mean, he didn't kill anybody. I think he's just. 
I think it's tax evasion, evasion and stuff. So like yeah. those are like we've arrested you, but you can get out on bail kind of stuff, yeah. and then we're probably not going to touch you for a couple of years because court system. I could be all wrong, but I don't think he harmed anybody. So, yeah. so I think he's out. I think he's back in California. Or is he up in Canada? Every now and then you get a, like a weird video from him. You know, go watch those. They're crazy. Oh, yeah. They're fantastic. Or he's right and we're all crazy. So, <laughs> Either way. Either way. It works out. Well, I think that's about the end of the show. I, I would recommend this movie. It's fun. 100%. It's worth watching. Yeah, it's a great 80s it's movie. It's one of those things. Yeah, it's a it's callback movie. movie. Yes. If you haven't watched it in a while, it's fun to sit back and, and rewatch. And if you never watch it, it's... it's, it's Prime Dennis Quaid. It's I mean, just for that. I mean, it is. It's, it, yeah. Just, just it's cr- it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And you can watch it if you have Amazon Prime. That's where we watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's it free. On Amazon Prime. It's, it's free on Prime. In fact, if I w- that's one of those key moments where if we had them as a sponsor, we'd be like, in fact, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. Just enter code <laughs> <Right>. Catacombs. <laughs> That'd be nice. One day. Uh, interesting side note before we end. I have bought this movie six times. <laughs> what? I have bought this movie. Six, I have six copies somewhere. You just keep forgetting. You're like, oh, I got to get it again. Right? No, no, I no, I keep forgetting I have it. So, like, and my my, my best friend Joshua will, will count this because he's bought it with me a few times um, when I was buying physical media. It's one of the reasons why I don't buy. There, I have copies of a lot of things, but yeah. I have I have six copies of Dreamscape. That's the main, terrible. The main reason was like, oh, I love this movie. I'll buy it. Yeah. And then I forget I own it. Yeah. Of and course. they're like, oh my god, I love this movie, and I will buy it. Yeah. I'm the Finding Dory no, of just about Dream, Dreamscape. You're the Finding Dory of Dreamscape. Right. That's totally but just for Dreamscape, we're yeah. like, I, it's it's insane. It's like, oh, this is good. Oh well. Oh, uh, Dreamscape. I had a birthday recently, and Scotty walks up and he's like, "Happy birthday!" and gives me a Blu-ray double feature. Hold on, uh, yeah, I, I gave, and one of these mainly for the one movie. On oh, the that's double, really for this one movie, and and really the reason why we do this podcast is for this movie, and we haven't done it yet, and I'm looking forward to doing it because one of my all it, it, this was a I, early on in our friendship because oh, yeah. we met through mutual friends. Right. Quick story, we met, and we'll talk about this. I'm sure on the episode, but we met through mutual friends, and one of the first conversations we had was talking about movies, and then somehow we landed on Eliminators, right? Because it's great, and we were like, oh my god, I love that movie. Right? There's who's seen it? Like eight people. <laughs> And it's one of the movies that has, like Jim Cotta, right. has stuck with me. Oh, yeah. And there's moments in it where I just wanted that for the rest so, of my life. So, Jim Cotta, I understand why there's not a, a remake. Sure. I, I totally, like, I get it. Eliminators. It has potential to be a remake. It has potential to be a remake. It, it, 100%. hundred I mean, it's not an, a well-made movie, but there's a great nugget of ideas in there. There's, no, there's, there's a whole lots. bunch of stuff in there you could, you could work with. Yeah. And... Um, it's it was made by Empire, and uh, when we do the episode, I have a, I have the I have a book about Empire and, and um, the studio, yeah, or the production company, and uh, there's some really interesting stuff about. And it. again, it has like Denise Crosby, who I had like a super crush on, and didn't realize it was her until after Tasha had died. Right? Have you ever met her? No, I have a couple times, a couple conventions. And I talk about uh, she likes she's recognized me a few times. Oh, yeah, it was, cause you know we're gonna talk about eliminators. Yeah, because she's like she's like you're one of the eight people who saw it. I'm like I know, right? It's a small club. Uh, I talk about this in another movie. I love her, her in called Miracle Mile. Miracle Mile. It sounds familiar. Maybe Anthony, you're talking about- Anthony Edwards is in it, and uh, it's about uh, it's an it's a nuclear holocaust film. So um, Anthony Edwards is a uh, from ER fame and um, Revenge of the Nerds. And he's Goose, right, from Top Gun. Yep, and he's on <laughs> something else right now too, and I can't remember what it but, is. But so uh, he was oh, designated of, survivor, right? So Anthony Edwards is a jazz musician who meets uh, a waitress, and they set up for a date. He oversleeps because she's working the late shifts, and he goes, "I'll take a nap, and then I'll go pick you up." Gets back to the diner, and when he gets to the diner, she's gone, and, he, and so he's going to go call her on the payphone because it's the eighties; no one had cell phones. Yep. And when he goes picks up the phone, he it's a uh, Someone's on the line, or like they had called, and uh, it's a it's a guy who's like a corporal or a private. Is like, hey, mom, dad, the bombs are coming. I, I wasn't supposed to call you, but I, you got to get out. You got it. So he's got the the death phone call, and now he's trying. And so he gets the call before anyone does. Crazy. And so it's this adventure of getting the girl and trying to find a way to survive because you know the end of the world is coming. Right. It's a fantastic movie. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I'd like to look. That I up. love. It. Yeah, it's a great movie. It's a, it's absolutely a great movie. Well, well, we may visit that and many other great movies on this podcast. You never know. We've got a whole list we want to do, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, happy birthday to you, sir. Thank you. And uh, this is Scotty saying, this is our contribution to the multiverse. Go out and make yours. Bye. Yakmala. Yakmala. Thank you for
for listening to the Mobcast Network.